<sighs> wow. I'm so fired up about that prayer that the Lord answered for that lady, that boy. Wow. That doesn't get any, doesn't get any better than that, does it? Whew. Man. So uh, we need to have another prayer vigil. And we need to have a bunch of prayer vigils in our homes on a, on a daily, weekly basis. We need to start praying like that, all of us. Amen? Amen. Whew, that's huge. Doesn't get any better than that. Mystery time. We're looking at Revelation 10 as we continue today in, in the fellowship of the Word and the Spirit. We want to look a little bit and see how this is going to play out for us. Because as you look at this, this is going to be the experience of every one of us who follow Jesus during the time of trouble. We're going to have these experiences and we're going to be in the middle of this situation. Revelation 10, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. This is Jesus. Now Jesus takes on these forms sometimes when he came to talk to uh, Abraham. He came as a human being before he was ever incarnated in Mary's womb. He came and two other angels came and they looked like humans too. Jesus can take on the form of an angel. In the, in the Old Testament, numerous times he is called the messenger of the Lord. And it is Jesus sometimes. Sometimes it's regular angels. Well, this one's Jesus. Same description that you find in Revelation 1. And we find Jesus coming down. And he had a little book open in his hand, a scroll that was opened in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Wow. Now, the artist here doesn't have that scroll open, but it is open in the Bible. And he's got flames of fire on his feet. And, and you know, they do the best they can. This is an incredible scene that John is depicting. And he is informing us that Jesus is taking total charge of the final movements of earth's history. I do not believe that the perfect will of God has been done very often since Adam and Eve rebelled. I believe the perfect will of God includes no one ever sinning. That's his perfect will. He did not want anybody to ever sin. It wasn't his plan. I believe that the perfect will of God includes no one or no thing like animals or plants or anything else, or, or animals and, and, and birds and fish. I don't believe God ever, ever willed that there be any death in his universe. So, his perfect will has been really put on pause for this world. But when Jesus comes down and does this, we are going to see God's perfect will begin to march towards the sea of glass. And that means us, his will working in us, taking us to the sea of glass. We're going to spend a thousand years with him. And then we're coming back here. And, and then, when we come back here, there's going to be some incredible things happen. We're going to be looking at that the following weeks and months. And finally, his perfect will will return to this world and to this universe. And there'll be no more sinning. There'll be no more dying. And praise God, will that be an awesome time. But we got a lot to go through until then. We got a whole lot to go through until then. And we need to be aware and we need to be equipping ourselves for that. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, the lion of the tribe of Judah. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Interesting. The, little, the scroll is open, it's unsealed, but he's now sealing something in the very next verse. So God can really shift some gears around sometimes, and we just need to be okay with that. Because if you're not okay with that, you need to go tell God you're not okay with that. 
He can handle that. You can say, hey, God, I'm not okay with this. I don't really like this, but I know you are doing things the way they're supposed to be done, so I'm going to surrender my will to you, and I'm going to let you give me some peace over this and not worry about it, and, and I can just go on about what I do know, and then whenever it's time for me to know about these seven thunders, then I'll know. You can spend a lot of time searching for that. You go online and you can read a lot of opinions on that. But I can guarantee you it's sealed. Because God said it was sealed. And, and, and until he's ready to open it up and, and reveal it, I think it's a lot of waste of time to try to find out. But if you've got lots of time, go ahead. And, and I believe it has something to do with the time of trouble. And if God reveals it to you, you know what the Bible says? If God reveals something to somebody in the church, they're supposed to submit it to the church, and then others who are spiritual leaders will pray over that and determine whether they've got the right interpretation on the seven thunders, if, if, if you claim you have that interpretation. And there's a, there's a process that you go through, that you develop things when, when you have a vision or a dream. And... And, and you check it with the scriptures, too. According to Acts chapter uh, 17, verse 11, you test all things with scripture and, and see if these things add up. I think it's, is it 17, 11 or 11, 17? I think it's 17, 11. I better double check my, my memory here. Yeah, my brain is still working. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea. Now see, sometimes they call Jesus an angel. In the Old Testament, he's referred to sometimes as an angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord was wrestling with Jacob. And Jacob found out he thought it was just a man. And it said it was the angel of the Lord. And he found out it was God that he was wrestling with because Jesus is God. But Jesus takes on the form of man sometimes. He takes on the form of an angel sometimes. People have a lot of problems with that, but I don't. Jesus is the servant of all. And he will do whatever it takes to save you and me. And he proved that on the cross that day. When he laid down, the psalmist, who, David, who saw that in vision, he describes what Jesus did that day, and the, and the Bible says, I am a worm and not a man. That's what Jesus said about himself. He, went that, he would stoop that low. He would become that inferior to who he really is. He's the eternal God. And yet he would, he would, he would condescend to humble himself, even to where he says in the book of Psalms, I am a worm and not a man. I call that my hero who would, who, would, who would lower himself to save me. Now, that's a real hero. That's a true hero. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it. And somebody said, well, now he's talking about Jesus. How can Jesus be talking about Jesus? Are you serious? In Matthew 4, the devil came to tempt Jesus, God in the flesh. And Jesus didn't say, I rebuke you. He didn't say, don't you know who I am? I created you, Lucifer. How dare you talk to me this way? He didn't do that. He said, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God. And no one else you should worship. He could have said, you should worship me, but he didn't. Instead, he referred to himself as the third person. So Jesus does this numerous times in the Bible where he is talking and he's talking about himself, but he's not saying me. He's saying, worship the Lord, your God. And when he came to dispute over the body of Moses, Moses had died. But he died because he couldn't go into the promised land and God put him to sleep. Because his eye had not weakened. He was 120 years old. He still didn't need uh, reading glasses. It, it, 120 years old. His eye had not weakened. Neither had his strength 
unabated. He was still just as strong as Caleb and Joshua. God put him to sleep, and then Jesus shows up, and he's fighting over the body of Moses with, with Satan. It's in the book of Jude. Jesus didn't say, I'm the creator of the universe, and I take possession of this body, Satan. You can't have him. And he, put, he didn't do it. He said, the Lord rebuked you, Satan. That was Jesus doing that. He didn't say, I rebuke you. He said, the Lord, as if the Lord was somewhere else, but the Lord was standing right there fighting over the body of Moses. So these things happen. And he says, uh, he who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea and the things that are in it. Man, that's exciting. Jesus is who did that. In the beginning was the Word. John chapter 1. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. All things that were made were made by Him and nothing that was made was made without Him. Jesus is the creator of the universe. Amen. Most Christians don't even have a clear grip on that. That there should be delay or time no longer. Now we're going to look at this time, mystery time. We're going to look at this in a minute. But that there should be no more delay, no more time as we know it. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, now, now we know where we're at. We're in the middle of the time of trouble. And we're actually in the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet begins in chapter 9. We looked at it the last two weeks. The sixth trumpet is the longest trumpet in the Bible. It begins there, and it goes all the way through chapter 10. Well, chapter 10 actually deals with some things that way before uh, the sixth trumpet. But it also goes all the way to chapter 11. The sixth trumpet does not end until three-fourths of the way or so through chapter 11. It actually says so. The second woe is past. The three woes are the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet. We're told that in chapter 8 of Revelation. And then in chapter 11, this, this sixth trumpet, things are happening under this sixth trumpet that have never happened in the history of the world. Because we are nearing the second coming of Jesus. And it, the sixth trumpet ends in Revelation 11. We're going to look at that in a, in a week or so. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, just before the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery of God will be finished. As he declared to his servants, the prophets. And he's been declaring this for 6,000 years. This mystery of God. And we're going to look at that mystery of God. In Colossians 1.26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, those who trust in Jesus. That's what a saint is. A saint is not somebody who does big miracles and, and, and never sins. A saint is somebody who has given their life to Jesus Christ, period. You become a saint the very moment you give your life to Jesus. You don't have to go out and prove that you need to be sainted by some organization. You become a saint as soon as you give your life to Jesus. He covers you with his amazing grace. He fills you with his amazing grace. He clothes you with his righteousness. You are as righteous as you could ever be because you are righteous by faith. You're as righteous as Abraham was ever able to become. Because you become righteous as soon as you put on Jesus Christ. Because you are saved by grace through faith, not through performance of works. And it's exciting. That's good news. That's pretty exciting news. So, he says, to them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery. To who? To the saints. To those who trust in Jesus. He's willing to make known to us the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. And here's, the, here's what the mystery is. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery of God. The fullness of God in you. And it gets really exciting. If you dig a little further, you find this is a huge, this is a huge like 
I don't know what they were doing in 1849 when they found gold out in Sutter's Mill. Man, they were excited. They were screaming and yelling. They should have been quiet. They shouldn't have told anybody because the next thing you know, the whole world is digging holes up in Northern California and they're killing each other for their gold claims and all kinds of stuff. They should have just not said anything. But I tell you what, you can't keep quiet when you find out about this gold. The God, the mystery of God is to, is to re- Produce in you and me the beauty and the glory of Jesus. Wow. That's better than any gold you'll ever bump into. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're going to look a little more. We're going to look a little more at Colossians. Him, Jesus, we preach, we proclaim, we declare, we exalt, warning every human being, not just the people that... I want to hang out with. We, we, we're, going to, we're going to warn every. We see every human being as a candidate for heaven. As a potential recipient for the mystery of God. We need to tell them what the mystery of God is. The mystery of God is to come into your life and cause you to stop hurting yourself. And cause you to stop hurting other people. In fact, it even goes beyond that to come into your life and cause you to be an extension of his healing, saving love and life. That's the mystery of God. When Christ floods your soul and my soul so much that that he, he, he pours out of our lives to heal others. Now that's what the apostles were doing in the first century in the book of Acts. Not only the apostles, every believer had that ability. Why? Because God gave it to them. When did he give it to them? In the upper room. And then every day they met house to house and they prayed like crazy. They prayed like we can't even imagine. And and when you pray, the Holy Spirit comes forth. Because guess what? The only reason you and I pray is because we've listened to the Holy Spirit. We've allowed him to lead us into pray. The Holy Spirit says, hey... Would you, would you just pray a little, and then I can give you more? And, and finally go, you know, I think that's really real. I think he wants to give me more. I think I better go do what Jesus did so that he can give me what he gave Jesus. Somebody says, oh, that's blasphemy. How can you expect God to give you what he gave Jesus? Well, I expect it. Because Jesus said, if you believe in me, the very works I have done, you will do also. That doesn't happen by some power you can drum up. That doesn't happen from some skill you can create in your soul. That happens from Christ coming into you and doing the work while we just cooperate and we allow him to do it. Not really hard. It's the hardest thing for humans to do. Surrender. It's the hardest thing for sinners to do is to surrender so that Jesus can live his life in us and through us. And man, it's exciting. How many of you know how exciting that is? It's exciting. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect, complete in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's the goal. That's our goal. Our goal is to reach every human being with the testimony of Jesus Christ, with who he is and his, his, what he is testified that we may present them every man that's our goal for every human being that's exciting God's pretty big he has some big goals to this end I also labor striving according to his working which works in me mightily he says to this end I am working and I'm striving according to his power to his working in me I'm doing it by faith I'm crying out to God, use me, God, do whatever you have to do to cleanse me and to heal me and to change me, and then then lead me out, God. I'm going, I'm going to go knock on that neighbor's door, God, and I'm going to trust you to fill my mouth the way you filled Peter's mouth that day on on the, the day of Pentecost when he came out in front of all those people, and many of them who had just murdered Jesus, the way, you've, the way you taught Peter what to say, the way you taught Moses what to say in, in Exodus 4.12. He said, go, Moses, I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what you shall say. 
We need to just have that kind of childlike faith. Say, I don't know what I'm going to say to my neighbor, but I'm going to go knock on that door for Jesus. And I'm going to trust him to fill my mouth and teach me what to say. When I see that person's face, I'm going to trust that somehow, the same way he did for Peter, crazy, egomaniac, selfish, dodo head Peter, I'm going to trust him that he's going to do the same thing for me that he did for Peter. Hello? How do you think he did? Peter didn't do it with his wisdom. Because his wisdom was garbage. His wisdom was a coward. His wisdom was, I don't even know who Jesus is. Don't talk to me. I don't even know the man. That was his wisdom. That's how messed up he was. And we're in the same boat. So we can get out of the same boat Peter was in, and we can walk on the water. And then we're going to find ourselves sinking, and then we're going to cry out to Jesus, and he's going to pick us up just like he did Peter. I mean... That's real. But we got to get out of the boat. We got to go knock on that neighbor's door. And when they answer the door, say, hi. Uh, whatever God tells you to say. I already know what I'm saying on a, lot, on a lot of but sometimes it changes right at the door. And then I walk away and say, man, I, I sure hope that was God. It didn't sound like what I thought God was going to tell me to say, but I hope he can use it somehow. What an experience life can be when we let God use us mightily for his glory. So that's, that's why we need Jesus in us, so we can do what Paul says he's doing. And oh, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 through 10, Paul says, I was born out of season. I was the, among the guys who walked with Jesus when he was here. But I was born out of season. And he says, and I did more work than all the other apostles. That's what Paul said. I did more work than all the other apostles. Sounds like he's bragging, but then he says, yet it was not I, it was the grace of God working in me that did all those things. Amen. Not I, but Christ. And that's what Paul's talking about here. His working in me. That's the mystery of God. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now here's some of that, here's the nuts and bolts. Here's some of the nuts and bolts. It's good to come to church and sing and, and, and feel good things and see nice things and hear nice things and be excited and, and happy and bubbly and, and ooey and gooey and have the hair stand up on your arm and your neck and go out, for, oh, so I felt so good today, I'm so happy. But I guess, tell you what, all those feelings are not going to carry the mail. It's not going to do the job. This is what does the job right here. The nuts and bolts of God of God's workings. And this is, this, is some, this is a place where it's really, you can see it. For the weapons of our warfare are not human. They're not human, carnal. They're not fleshly. But mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Satanic strongholds. Bad habits. Evil uh, feelings and desires. You pull down all, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought into captivity. That's the mystery of God. When Christ comes into our lives so fully that there's not even anything in our mouths that can harm anybody, like Revelation 14 talks about the 144,000. I don't know who the 144,000 is going to be. I don't know for sure much about them. But I know that even if I don't get to be one of them, and, and, and people have a, oh, he thinks he's going to be one of the 144,000. No, I don't think that. I hope it, but I don't think it. you got to be a real goofball to think you're going to be one of the 144,000. That's probably the first reason you wouldn't get to be one of the 144,000 if you're thinking you're going to be one. God doesn't work that way. He, he looks for people that are humbling themselves and say, God, it, it, you know, if I could be just a doorkeeper, please use me. Now, you know, he doesn't look around for me, oh, he thinks he's going to, I think I'll grab him because he thinks he's going to be one of the 144,000. That's the first disqualifying issue. But I hope now, what's wrong with hoping that God is going to use me more than I can imagine? I don't see anything wrong with hoping to be one of the 144,000. 
In fact, neither did the greatest preacher the Seventh Evidence has ever produced believed it too. That we should all be striving to be among the 144,000. We should all be willing to say, here am I. Send me. It's your choice. And if all I get to do is do, if all I get to do is do their laundry and wash their dinner dishes, I will be happy to do that. As long as I know that's what God's called me to do. And God will test you on this stuff. It's one thing to go tell God, oh God, I'll do anything even if if it's digging ditches. It's one thing to tell him that. It's another thing when he says, go dig ditches, and he finds out if you're digging them happily, or you're digging them, say, what in the world am I doing here? Why didn't God give me a better job than this? Well, you just failed. You just failed the course if you do that. Anybody listening? He will test you. I remember when I first started preaching, and I had people, oh, God is with you, brother. He's going to put you before great crowds. You're going to do great work for God and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. You know what my next job was? Cleaning out chicken coops. <laughs> God will find out if you really surrendered or not. And if, you don't, if you're not in there singing, if you're not in there singing, the joy of the Lord is my strength, or, or Jesus' name above all names, if you're not in there worshiping God while you're cleaning out the chicken coop, guess what? Your next job may be cleaning out the pig pen until you learn that it's not based on your circumstances as to whether you worship the king of kings, as to whether you exalt him in joyful praise. It's not based on how you feel. It's not based on your bank account. It's not based on your job. It's not based on anything other than the fact that he is worthy. Amen. You want God to elevate you, you got to let him take you down first. And you got to be happy in Jesus. Or else you're going to walk around that desert for 40 years and die. And that's no fun. I'd rather be Joshua and Caleb any day. Bringing our weapons, the weapons God has given us, have the ability to bring every thought into captivity to the beautiful life and ways of Jesus Christ. Man, it doesn't get any better than that. Don't you know Peter was excited? Wow. Can you imagine? He went from being a little creep, just a jerk, bragging on himself all the time, telling dirty jokes, cussing and claiming he didn't even know who Jesus was. He went from being a total loser to where he could walk up and say to this man who's crippled, for 30-some years, begging. And he says, I don't have any gold and silver, brother. But what I have is Jesus. And I'm, gonna let, I'm, I'm just going to share Jesus with you right now. Rise up and walk. Can you imagine how exciting and how incredible, how fulfilling that must have been for Peter to watch the Holy Spirit working through him to rescue a perishing soul. And Saul of Tarsus, he's going around helping kill Christians. He's going around taking all their household, he's kicking them out of their houses. He's taking their property and dividing it up with his buddies. And he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff and he's as ugly as you can get. And a few years later, they're taking pieces of his clothing, laying it on demon-possessed people, crippled people, sick people. And, and as soon as his clothing would touch them, the Holy Spirit would raise them up, and they'd go leaping and, and, and jumping and praising God through the temple. I can't imagine. That's Christ in you. That's, when, when that happens, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. The glory of God in a sinner to the degree that the same works that Jesus did just manifest in a beautiful way. Absolutely amazing. 
I don't know about you, but I want Jesus in charge of all my thoughts. And any time the devil tries to dig up some of that old crud, I want the word of God in my mind, sharper than a two-edged sword, crucifying those ugly things and keeping them nailed to the cross. That's incredible. And here, and this is incredible. For those that still don't believe what I'm saying or what the word is saying, after he does that, after he does that, after he brings our thoughts, and after he does it worldwide in the church during the time of trouble, and the seal of God is applied to the believers, look what he's gonna get, look what he's gonna do. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When the saints, when the church, when the church's obedience is fulfilled. Now God hasn't punished anybody yet. If you think what has happened down here is punishment, it's not. Now, he's stopped a few people from doing more evil. He's done some things like that. And he's in charge of those things. He's, he opened up the earth one time and swallowed up a whole bunch of people that were trying to kill Moses. And they were wanting to kill Moses and Aaron. And it was the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abihu. And, and, and that wasn't punishment. That was just stopping them. The punishment doesn't even come until after we're in heaven for a thousand years. That's punishment. When someone gets destroyed because they have chosen to not allow God to heal and save them, and because they've chosen rather to reflect the character of God's enemy and to become a predator just like God's enemy, when, when, when people choose to be predators, God will destroy them because he's a responsible bridegroom. And any bridegroom, any groom that would not defend his wife from a predator is not worthy to have a wife. But God is worthy. And when the, when the wicked surround the new Jerusalem, led by Satan himself, and they have all the state-of-the-art weaponry you, we can't even imagine, and they aim it right at God and right at you and I if we're in the New Jerusalem. When they do that and they are about to destroy physical matter because these weapons have the ability to destroy physical matter, but they cannot destroy God because God is a spirit. And when they surround and when they aim these incredible destructive weapons that Satan helps them build, which we can't even begin to imagine, and they're getting ready to pull the trigger, fire will come down out of heaven from God. That's word for word what Revelation says. And destroy the wicked. Now that's a groom worthy of a bride. And I'm not going to change it. You can teach it however you want to do it. The Bible says that's what God's going to do. God is my hero, and I'm not going to change it. And then it's so easy. It's so really easy to let this happen. So as soon as we let God do this, and I don't know what his number, but evidently he has a certain number because under the fourth seal, the fifth seal, he tells symbolically in a caricature, he tells the people who are dead that your blood will be avenged as soon as the number of those who are to be killed the way you are killed is completed. So God has a number. I don't know what the number is, but as soon as he gets that number, things are going to roll. He had a number in Sodom and Gomorrah, and they didn't make it. That number came short. But this number is going to happen. God will populate heaven. He has a number. And when we hit that number, this thing's going to go. Being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When we allow Jesus to take us over with the seal of God during the time of trouble. And here's how easy it is. But we all, 
with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. That's Jesus. He is the fullness of God in human form. Uh, Colossians says it point blank. In him dwells the fullness of God. Beholding Jesus are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, there's people that have launched a war against anybody who uses these kind of words. Now, there may be some kooks out there that are doing, you know, this disciplines and I don't know what all you call it. But I want to tell you something. If, if, If this word transformed is so evil, why is God using it? We need transformation. Now, we don't need to do it as an Eastern guru, as an Eastern mystic, or some, you know, some crazy thing. We don't need to smoke peyote and go off into some trip to be transformed. We don't need to do any of that. That's all counterfeit. That's all garbage. But we need to drink the new wine of the Holy Spirit. He is the new wine. And we need to be transformed. At least I do. Anybody else wants, anybody else thinks you need some transforming? I'd like to hear it. Amen. Amen. I think she wants to be transformed too. <laughs> so, yeah, me too. <laughs> but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Here's the major key word. This word is not just looking at something. This word is adoring, adoring what you're looking at. That's what that word is in the Greek. You adore what you're looking at. You adore Jesus Christ. If you look at him with adoration, you will be changed into his image, into his same image. And you will do the very works he did because he is in you, the mystery of God, working in you and me, the hope of glory. Absolutely amazing. It was really that easy even in Moses' day. Absolutely that easy. It's never been hard. No one has ever been saved by keeping the law. Never. It's never been a requirement to keep the law to be saved. It's always been a promise that if you let God into your heart to save you, you will keep the law. It doesn't say keep the law and God will save you. It says let God save you and then you'll be able to keep the law. It's a big, 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 big difference. Look, he said, Moses said, God told Moses, make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and everybody that looks at it will be saved from the evil. It's that easy. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. How many of you, without saying where it is, know where that scripture is? Raise your hand if you really know where that scripture is. I got one brave soul here. I got two brave souls. Do I hear three? There's a third right there. Well, she doesn't count. She's got the whole book of Daniel and Revelation memorized, so that that doesn't count. You know, it's really a blessing to know where these things are in the Bible. You know why it's such a blessing? Because the devil's going to come to you and say, that's not in the Bible. Well, I think it's in the Bible. I thought it was in the Bible. I think my pastor said it was in the Bible. My mom used to say it was in the Bible, but I don't know where it is. You know what? You better know where it is. And and, and, and then for a second blessing, you go try to tell somebody else, well, guess what's in the Bible? You tell them, where's that in the Bible? Well, I don't know, but it's in there. Oh, really? You're one of those kind of Christians? You're going to expect me to believe just because you said it? You're not God, unless you can tell me where God said it. I'm not believing it. That's a real big issue, right? It's in, well, Mark, what what does the book start with? What letter? H. H. Now does anybody know where it is? Yeah, Hebrews. Hebrews 12. 1 and 2. And you know what? You cannot get to Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Unless you get to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Because Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, offer yourself up as a living sacrifice. And when you offer yourself up as a living sacrifice, that's when you get to see Jesus. When you surrender. Oh, yeah. 
If you don't surrender, you won't even listen about You won't even listen to anybody talk about Jesus. If somebody comes up to you talking about Jesus, you've got to start surrendering or else you just reject, 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 and your heart gets hard. This happens. That's why we have to pray real hard for people before we go up and talk to them about Jesus. Because the devil's there to make sure they turn hard. He's not sleeping. He's roaming around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So look at the serpent on a pole. And Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. How can Jesus be parallel to a snake? Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. So that you and I could become the righteousness of God. There's that mystery of God thing again. So that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's how easy it is. We got a few minutes here. And this is how exciting the mystery time thing is. Paul says, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4.4. This is supposed to be, where do you think this is? Where? What's the star of? Bethlehem. When the fullness of time had come, it was time. The 70 weeks, the 490 years of Daniel 9 was rolling and coming to an end. It was time for Messiah to come, according to Daniel chapter 9. And he came right on time. The three wise men and the three leaders and rulers of the east, wealthy, they were studying the book of Daniel because Daniel's book was in the east. Daniel had lived in Babylon. That's where they came from. And studying Daniel, said, it's time. Let's get over there and find out where he's supposed to be born because Daniel didn't tell us where he's supposed to be born. But they found out that Micah told us where he was supposed to be born. When they got to Jerusalem, crazy man Herod, he sent the people scrambling to try to find out where he's supposed to be born because he wanted to go kill all the babies. And they go digging through the Bible because they hadn't been reading their Bibles. But they went digging to the Bibles. And oh, here in Micah it says Bethlehem. So the three wise men trot off to Bethlehem. Because the time had come. Jerusalem was astir. And there's Daniel's. We're going to go into that more and more as we go through Revelation. 70 weeks is 490 days. Day for a year in prophecy, Ezekiel 4, 6. And Numbers 14, 16 says... In prophecy, not always, but sometimes a day can be a year. And it just worked out this way. There are three, I think there's three 490-year cycles in the Hebrew nation. Maybe four. I, I, actually, I think it's four. There's, I think there's four 490-year cycles. And, and it's, it's amazing. Something really incredible happened at every 490-year point. But this was not good for Jerusalem when this one happened. They lost everything because they rejected the Messiah. This is what they were supposed to do, but they didn't even come close. We'll go into that more and more as we go on. Finishing up chapter 10, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it, eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I, it, It's exciting when you first hear, and it's exciting, you've got to go tell everybody about Jesus, you know, and then you bring them to church, or you try to get them to come to church, and next thing you know, they won't even, they, they avoid you. They see you coming, and they hide. It gets kind of bitter when uh, people start rejecting you simply because you've decided to love and follow Jesus. Well, it's going to get really bad when they really team up against the family and the body of Christ. So he took it, he ate it all. We need to be eating it all. We need to be eating the whole book. We need to eat all the word, every word that comes from the mouth of God. Man that shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He says, you must prophesy again about or before is what I think it really means. Many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. 
there's a job for every one of us. There's plenty of work to go around, and the pay is out of this world. The salary cannot be calculated. It's priceless. But you saw, we went through this last week. Ezekiel had the same experience. Eat what I give you. Open your mouth. You know, there was a hand stretch out. And there's this little scroll, a book was in it. Ezekiel had that experience. He ate it. And it was full of heartbreak and warnings and serious business and, 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 a, and a sober time. Well, Peter said, be sober and vigilant because the devil's like a lion trying to... The devil is being allowed by God, just like he was allowed by God to increase his intensity against Job, he is being allowed by God to increase his intensity against the human race. And Paul confirms it in Timothy. He says it's going to increase. God's going to increase. He's going to allow it to increase. He said to me, eat what you find. Eat this scroll. I opened my mouth. He caused me to eat it. I don't even know how to eat the Bible unless God helps me. And it was sweet in my mouth, just like John's experience. It's been the same. It was the same for Abel. Cain wouldn't eat it. Cain rejected the voice of God, the word of God, and he paid dearly. Your words were found and I ate them. Jeremiah had the same experience. They threw him in a sewer. They threw him down in a sewer pit. It was a cistern, but it had become full of crud. And they tried to kill him. That's a bad way to die is to be thrown into a sewer pit and get infections and viruses and hepatitis and who knows what else was in that sewer pit. That's a pretty bad way to die, folks. These people were mean. And they're going to be, the same, they're going to be just as mean during the time of trouble. That's why we need more and more and more of Jesus, all of Jesus. Here's what Jesus said he came to do. And he accomplished, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. I speak my Father's words. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep, who cherish, who value, who embrace the commandments of God. And have the witness of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus. Big word. Jesus was on the cross. And his testimony was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And I need Jesus in me so that I can pray that way when people are spitting on me. I've been spit on for the gospel before. I might not have been presenting it perfectly, but they thought I was doing damage to their kingdom, and so they spit on me. I've been beat up by a black belt in karate, and it was simply because I was telling people that God loved them so much that he gave them Jesus on the cross. And it was in the street. And it was the drug pushers and the pimps who were beating me up. And it was a miracle of God that I didn't pick up the pipe and hit him in the head with it. Because the pipe was laying right there. And it wasn't because Paul Lundgren is any good. Because Paul Lundgren is filthy rags. But it was because there was enough of Jesus in me that I was able to look at this guy who just beat me up and the blood was squirting out of my mouth. I was able to look at him and say, God still loves you. And so do I. And that's a much mightier weapon than a lead pipe. And I'm going to be looking for that guy in heaven. He's, he, he, peeled, he got in his car and he peeled out that night and I never saw him again. But I'm going to be looking for him in heaven because some serious seed got planted in his brain that night. And I know that God loved him just as much as he loves me. And I'm sure God sent somebody else a few days later to work on him some more. To try to get him to surrender his ugly life to the beautiful life of Jesus. I hope none of you ever get beat up because you're telling people about Jesus, but you need to be willing, able, and ready to endure suffering as a soldier because he 
is worthy. And the people around us need him just as much as you and I need him. And because the Jesus is saying from the cross, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, I need to be able to pray that prayer for the people who, who, who attack me or who cause me trouble. And if you can't pray that prayer right now, I know somebody who can give you a new heart. He can give you a transplant. He can bring every thought into obedience to, to purity, to loveliness, to holiness. He can do it. It may not happen overnight, and it most likely won't happen overnight, but it's sure better than going the other direction. Amen? Amen. I used to raise pigs. And not once did I, was I ever tempted to go wallow in the mud hole with the pigs. Not once. Because there's usually a lot of other stuff in there besides just mud. If you know what I mean. But that's what we do every time we neglect Jesus. Every time we, we grieve the Holy Spirit away and we go do something that the rest of the world's doing, it may not even look that evil, it may not even smell that bad, but every time we, we neglect Jesus or we, we, we pull back from, from following his will in our lives, we are literally wallowing with the pigs in the mud hole. Uh, just like the prodigal son. He was in there with the pigs. And if you don't really have a good grip on that, give me a call. And I'll make an appointment and we'll go find a pig farm. And I'll let you dive right on in. So you can get something in your head that maybe not be there right now. So as, as, as Jesus is calling, it's by way of Calvary. He's saying, I love you. He said, I love you so much that I laid down on this cross and I allowed my heavenly father to take your sins and the sins of every human being all the way back to Adam. I allowed him to take all the ugliness of sin and I allowed him to curse me with that sin because cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Galatians 3.13, he was cursed with your sin and mine. And it broke his heart. It violated his soul. And I don't ever want to do anything again that will cause him that kind of pain. And the only way I can avoid it is to just keep surrendering to Jesus. Just keep saying, here, Jesus, here, here am I. Here, take my life, Lord. Do whatever you have to do to change me so people can see you more. I think that's a good thing to pray. And if you believe that, I hope you have time to stay and either pray by yourself or pray with somebody else here. There's, there may be somebody sitting near you that, they, that really needs to hear your prayer today. There may be somebody really hurting so bad, they just need to hear that somebody cares enough to take two, two, two minutes and 43 seconds to say a prayer of love for that person. There may be somebody like that around you. If you don't have time, you're free to go. There's not gonna, nobody's going to be looking down there Long noses of self-righteousness. And if they are, don't worry about it. But if you have time and you're comfortable, either, either find someone to pray for or let somebody pray for you. And I know that you will leave here a better servant for Jesus, for surrendering at his feet. Amen. God bless you as you go and as you pray with each other.